So, <coughs> life is a bit of a lottery. Now, what we end up doing in life, which career we pursue, how far we go along that path, depends obviously upon our talent and hard work. But it also depends upon things we do not control. So as an example, which family are you born in? How wealthy it is? What caste? What religion? But these are things that we understand reasonably well. There is one more factor which we often overlook and it plays a very, very critical role, which is whether you're born or raised in a city or in a small town or in a village. Depending upon where you're born and where you live, right, that determines to some extent what you end up doing in life. And this is a kind of a lottery. And lacks of children in rural areas who are not at the, who are not benefiting from this, who are at the receiving end of this lottery, right, their career does not take off. All their talent just dies. And this lottery of life is what I'm going to talk about today, right? And I want to talk about how it has influenced my career and why, why we should do something about it. I was born in a very modest family of limited means. My father was a soldier in the armed forces. And uh, my parents come from a very, a very backward, a very rural village in eastern UP, uh, which is where I was born in, a, in my father's family, uh, family house. Now, because my father joined the armed forces, we could come out of that environment and could actually see the world and got an exposure to things outside. Now, when I was a kid, like, Really, really small. I did not have any talent. I was, uh, I was extremely shy. I was not very good in sports. So when all the other kids would be kind of, you know, running around and playing, I would be standing in a corner hoping that nobody comes and sees me, right? And uh, obviously my parents didn't like that. So they wanted me to be like really active, run around and, you know, do stuff. And that didn't happen. So they would buy me a cricket kit or, you know, football, hoping that I would go and play. No, nothing. So, it didn't seem very promising and that's how life was until I reached class 5 and it so happened that I topped my class that year. Now suddenly, somebody who felt like, you know, good for nothing, now I was good for something. So there was one thing which I thought I was good at, studies. Now all of us, deep down, all of us want to be somebody special, right? So for me, studies became that thing, that something, you know, which gave me the license to be special, which made me feel a little different from everybody else. And I lashed onto it. And, and my ambition as a kid was to become an engineer, which is fine. But the problem was, in my whole extended family, relatives, anybody, acquaintances, I did not know anybody who was a doctor or an engineer or for that matter anybody accomplished academically. In fact, there were hardly any college graduates. So I was, at that point, my, uh, my father was posted in Assam. So we were in a very, very remote place. And uh, when I went from class 8th to class 9th, at that time, my father got, father got posted to Allahabad. Now, this one small thing ended up changing my life. I'll show you how. So when I was in Labad, uh, in class 11th, two first year students from IIT Kanpur came to my school. So they were having a vacation and they came and uh, they came to the class and, and gave a talk. And they told us about IITs, about ITJ entrance and what a wonderful place it is and kind of interesting stories, anecdotes. And we were all like fired up, right? And then, and then I, I kind of thought, you know, okay, so I want to go to an IIT. Now, so what did I do? So I said, okay, let me just go and uh, let me just go and buy a book. So I bought a book which had previous year's IITJ question papers. I'm sure many of you must have seen that. Right? Now, I started going through all the problems and because I was a class topper, I was able to solve all the problems. I'm just kidding. I could not put, I literally, I could not put my pen on paper. There wasn't a single problem, right, that I could get started on despite being the so-called class topper. So now this was a big jolt. Right? On top of that, in the school I was in, in last 15, 20 years, in fact, as far, as, as far back as people could remember, there wasn't, there wasn't one single person who had been to an IIT. On top of that, India being India, you have neighbors, right? And they'll keep telling you what you can and what you cannot do. And you know, they kind of tell you, you know, it's, it's not going to happen, right? 
But the advantage was I was in Allahabad, which was a kind of a center for test preparation, entrance exams, etc. So it was not very hard to get information about, you know, what books to, to use, how to prepare, and there was reasonably good coaching support. With all of that, I, I got into it, and I slogged for one year, and then I made it to IIT Kanpur, and I joined electrical engineering branch. Now, this is, this photograph shows my last year at IIT, and as you can see, we're all very happy. These are my wingmates, I'm happy because, you know, it's kind of over, right? Now, I would like to claim that I got into IIT because of my innate talent and, and hard work and smartness, but that's not totally true. There are, there, there were thousands of students, possibly in UP, Bihar, West Bengal, Assam, lot of places who were just as good, maybe better than me, but they never had the opportunity. In case you're not convinced, I'll give you some data. The first year batch of IIT Kanpur, we had about 300 students, 300 plus. Right? Now, IIT Kanpur used to attract students from the whole of Northern Belt of India. So starting from Rajasthan, UP, Bihar, West Bengal, and so on. Right? Now, Kanpur city, where IIT was located, accounted for approximately 1% of this whole population, 1%. Right? Now, if I ask you, simple maths, right? If, IIT, if, if Kanpur city is 1% of the whole, so to say, catchment area, then what percentage of IITs should be from Kanpur city? 1%? No. That was 20%. 20 times more. What does it mean? It means that if there is so much talent in Kanpur city, it does not mean that the kids there are special. What it means is that there is, if you take the same population in a rural area, you probably have the same amount of talent. But then what happens to all that talent? Where does it go? That talent dies. Unseen, unheard. They never get the opportunity. This is the tragedy. Right? And, and the flip side of this is, once you get lucky, that luck stays with you. In fact, I have been the, I have been the beneficiary of that. Let me show you. So after, after I got into IIT, in the final year, I decided to write civil services. Now, as you know, civil service is a fairly tough exam, a lot of competition, very, very few number of seats. But because I was in IIT and before me, my seniors, many of them had cracked civil services. In fact, every year, the top ranker, the topper and top rankers used to be from IIT Kanpur, a lot of them. So when I saw those guys, I was like, okay, you know, if this guy can do it. You know, he also went through the same selection process. He had the same education, right? If he can do it, I can do it, right? And that gave me a lot of confidence and self-belief. And once you have confidence, half the battle is won right there. On top of that, I could easily figure out, okay, how to prepare. So which topic to focus on, which books to use, how to go about it. So with all that know-how and that confidence, I dived into it. And obviously a slog slog for six to eight months and right after my BTEC I wrote the exam and I got into IPS. I was assigned to Kerala Carter and uh, so this is uh, one of the photographs from my stint as the Trivandrum Police Commissioner. Now I had a wonderful stint in the IPS so nothing to complain about. I'm, I'm really very, I would say again very very lucky. When I was still hardly like in my late 20s I became the Police Commissioner in Trivandrum City and Initially, it was an exciting job, you know, a lot of new things. So having to handle law and order disturbances, crowd control, VIP securities, everything was new, everything was challenging. But, but slowly, you do the thing first time, it's great. Second time, kind of, you know, it's a little monotonous. Then, then gradually, the excitement started going down. It started to become more and more boring. Right? And at some point, I felt that I was not enjoying it. Now, imagine I'm 30 years old and I'm having a full-blown midlife crisis. Right? What do I do? If I can stay on, obviously, don't get me wrong, IPS was a great career. You, I, I would have become a DGP guaranteed, like 100% with all my batchmates. Um, you are well taken care of. It's very well respected. Uh, it's probably the most, one of the most secure jobs in this country. But then the question is, do I go for job security or do I go for self-expression? Do I go for something that is going to excite me, make me, make me energized? Against the advice of every single person, I decided to resign from the IPS and go for an MBA. Now, I wanted to go for an MBA at one of the top business schools in the world, either at Harvard or Wharton or, or Stanford, one of those places. And as you know, these are very, very competitive. Right? Once again, my IIT degree helped me. Without the IIT degree, I probably would not have had that confidence. And because my IIT friends had been to these places, and we again, we knew how to go about it, how to write the applications, how to 
uh, do the GMAT and so on, it made things easier. And I applied, I got into the Wharton MBA program, which is one of the top MBA programs in the world and finance it's rated one of the best. And uh, I was now at Wharton in a class of about 800 people and I was the only ex-cop, only police officer and it was fun. And um, sometimes, not often, sometimes I felt that, you know, people were thinking like, I, I found people occasionally a little condescending, a little smug police officer, like what would he know? They were all people from business experience. I had no, I had no prior business experience, obviously. So then I told, whenever I used to feel, I used to tell myself, let me prove it, prove it to myself, right? That I can do something. So I, again, for next two years, I slogged really, really hard, right? And when the MBA program got over, I was in the top 5% of the class and I was a Palmer Scholar, a top honors dis distinction awarded to people who are in that 5% in that bracket. This is the Wharton Business School and after Wharton I joined McKinsey. McKinsey as you know is one of the world's top strategy consulting firms and uh, this was at McKinsey and here's the fun part. Right? Before McKinsey I had spent literally how many days in private sector? Zero. I had zero corporate experience and now I was advising the senior most executives of world's top corporations on how to run their businesses, how to improve operations, how to improve strategy and so on. Experience is not everything. Knowledge can be gained through a lot of other means and this is one of my, one of my big learnings. Now, after, after McKinsey, I wanted to come back to India and then I, I came to Bombay and I, I was an investor with a private equity fund. When I, when I look back at all of this, I feel like I've been in some ways very lucky. I, I had a lot of goals I set for myself and I was able to achieve all of them. And obviously it was a lot of hard work and there is some merit, no doubt. But all of this could have just gone to dust if one thing had changed. What is that? When my father was posted from Assam to Allahabad, had he been posted to Imphal or Tripura or some other remote place where there was no information, no coaching support, no guidance, I would not have made it to IIT for sure. And everything after that would have changed, which means what about the children who do not have the privilege that I had? What's happening to them? Nothing. And that is a tragedy. And, that is, and that's a huge problem. Let me quantify it for you. Today, out of 10 students, 7 are in rural areas or, or small towns, probably more. So it's like, you know, you have a, visualize a table on which there are 10 rough diamonds kept there. Okay? 10 diamonds. And what do we do? We polish 3 of them, the ones in the city, and remaining seven, we throw them away. Every year, it's happening right now. And that needs to stop. Now, if you want to bring those children up, what can we do? There are many things that we want to change, but as an example, you want to change family wealth, it's very hard to change, how do you do that? But there is one thing that can change their lives, that is education. Education has changed my life, it can change your life, it can change everybody's life, and we owe it to ourselves and to, to them to give everybody access to quality learning. A Couple of years back, my last job, I was with a private equity fund, it's a billion dollar fund, and it was one of the most wonderful jobs I've had. Every luxury, every comfort I could imagine I had. Travel business class, do what you want, complete freedom, it was amazing. But I decided to leave that. I resigned and I became an entrepreneur. Today I teach science. My goal is to, to bring out the, the wonders of physics to students in rural areas and, uh, and that's what I do. Today there are millions of kids who deserve good science learning but they're not getting the opportunity. I believe that if I can I can help even a small fraction of them. I would have achieved a lot more than I set out to when I resigned from the IPS. Now, this problem of giving quality learning to rural to students in rural areas, it's not an easy problem. It's a big, it's a huge problem. The problem is bigger than me, it's bigger than you, it's bigger than my startup. So a lot of us, all of us have to come in and contribute and do our bit from startup entrepreneurs to investors to teachers to all of you to professionals. Question is, what can you do? Do something. If you can, if it's possible, teach one student. Today, technology, uh, internet penetration, hardware, everything is freely accessible. Today, we have the means to reach out to probably not every child, but, but most of those children. If you cannot teach 
regularly teach one hour a week do it online you cannot do one hour a week do one hour a month if you cannot do that find some way to support them to guide them to motivate them when you go to your village or interact like inspire them there is something that we all can do i want this i want this to be a war cry for science education in rural areas we all can contribute and we have to contribute think of it this way there are all these raw diamonds left there on the table visualize that if we want india to shine all these raw diamonds they have to be polished they have to shine and we all can do something about it today i'm going to ask all of you and everybody who's watching this let's step up and and do something about it make our contribution and if we start today one day we will get there <laughs>